much. Thank, Thank you. you. Now, one of the biggest hits on the London stage for years, Jerusalem is about to make a return after an award-winning stint on Broadway. The play was both critically acclaimed and much loved by audiences, as was Mark Rylance in the central role of Johnny Byram. I'll be talking to Mark in a moment about what the play says about England and Englishness now, and about his own reputation as, among other things, arguably the greatest English actor of his generation. Mark Rylance has been called everything from a genius to an eccentric, although perhaps in the theatre the one implies a bit of the other. His career as an actor, theatre director and writer led to a string of awards and extraordinary accolades. Al Pacino once said he made Shakespeare sound as if the bard had written the words for him the night before. For within the hollow crown that rounds the mortal temples of the king keeps death his court. <laughs> Rylance was the first artistic director of the revived Globe Theatre, which some predicted would be some kind of theme park disaster. But Rylance proved them wrong and turned it into a beloved English institution. The play Jerusalem is itself, above all, very English. Written by Jez Butterworth, Rylance was immediately drawn to the role of the wanted wild man of the woods, Johnny Rooster Byron. He called him an indigenous force of nature, like a dragon or a forest fire. Rooster is a liar, drug dealer, waster, holding court in a rundown caravan in Wiltshire, railing against the authorities who want to move him on. Happy St. George's Day! Now kiss my beggar arse! You Puritans! Part of the appeal is that Jerusalem is a comic tale from the edges of society. Pot-smoking hoodies, soulless housing estates, tedious bureaucrats. Murder, she wrote. Three hours of Pac-Man on my phone. But it's the deeper themes of the meaning of Englishness, now in the 21st century pasteurised reality of modern Britain, that have engaged the critics and the audiences. And Mark is with me now. I'm going to ask you the most difficult question first, which is why does that play strike such a chord? Because it's sometimes difficult to figure it out. You must have thought about it. I suppose I have, yeah. I've never been in a play where people have... I've left the theatre at night and found people sleeping on, on the concrete on, outside the theatre to get in. Uh, it seems that people are hungry for something and the play feeds that hunger. Jez describes it as a battle of logos and mythos. And I said, what do you mean by that? He said, logos is the thing of we need to eat. So we've got to kill that big animal over there. So we've got to organize it. You've got to distract the animal. I'll hit it on the head. Hopefully we'll be able to eat. And it doesn't work for a long time. And you get, you know, logos. But when eventually you do get to eat, then, then the more important thing happens, which is mythos, which is why are we here? What's the point of this? What does that mean? What, how, where do we come from? Where do we go? And I think that the culture at the moment is compressing us to be so logical all the time, all these economic problems, all these things. I mean, everyone has debts, but you don't have to think about it all the time. But it seems like the pressure on people is, is to be logical and functional all the time. And so there's a great hunger for something more mysterious. I, a friend of mine said to me just before we came on, you know, uh, the character you play is a sort of dodgy bloke that every one of us knows a bit of. You see in the dodgy pub that you maybe drank in when you were a teenager but you don't want to go in anymore. And th there is something about that that also strikes the chord, isn't there? Yeah, that's certainly why I took the part because I, I, I was very impressed by people like that on the edge of the town when I was growing up. Because you, you grew up in the suburbs. I mean, it's not quite, you know, it wasn't quite in a In America I grew up, in, but I also spent my summers in Kent. And, um, and I was always very struck when I would come back from the Midwest of America, surrounded by Coca-Cola executives, to this little village, Sissinghurst, in Kent. For instance, there was a man, Mr. Dysart, who, who lived with his wife in a council flat there, but he, he liked to dress as a woman. And whenever he went out down the shops, he came with his apron and a wig, all very wonky, but not, no one picked on him. Everyone said, hello, Mr. Dysart, hello, he'd say. And, he, and I, I thought that was amazing, that there was a, there was a kind of, um, maybe because it's an island, there was an, it seemed to be more of an acceptance of eccentricity here. Well, uh, yeah, uh, eccentricity. You've been called an eccentric. Have I? You have, you have. <laughs> as you know, but, uh, sort of, which is almost mandatory in a way for, for, for anyone who, who tries to be creative. Are we do you think one of the pro problems in the, this country 
touched on in the play, is we're squeezing out the uh, allowing people to be eccentric, this kind of marginal life where people are allowed to be slightly weird. I don't think you can make so much money off of people if everyone is independent. If everyone wants Coca-Cola from a different size bottle, it, you, the Coca-Cola doesn't make so much money as if everyone accepts that it all comes in the same bottle. And, uh, uh, but, you know, you look around and no one's the same. So there's a basic problem in, in my mind in, in, in um, the, the, the organizations that are formed to make money out of selling things and who we really are, which is independent. But isn't, isn't one of the strong things uh, about English people and again touched on the plate, is that the English are very resistant to change. They don't like being told by the bureaucrats and others to do things. They really, really hate it, and that also strikes a chord. It tell, in other words, it tells you something about Englishness. I suppose that's true. I, I suppose when you go to America, there is an excitement about new things in America, and there's a little bit more of a caution here in England. But, but I feel if you do... In America, everyone's your best friend right away, but you don't feel like you get very deeply I I into their friendship. Here, people hold you off, but when they do let you in, then they let you in more deeply, I think. Well, why do you think this worked in America? I mean, Enron, a great God. play, didn't work in America. Americans well, didn't like it. With this play, they did, and this is very English. I think it's basically about, about people who want to stay and have to go, and people who want to go and have to stay. And, and, you know, you don't have to believe in the Mayan prophecies or see a Roland Emmerich film to realize that the way we're living is not really sustainable, that everyone has a consciousness underneath that, that a big change is coming, and it's hard to change it in ourselves, and it's hard to, for the governors to change it. But, but one's aware that it can't really go on like this, that we all have a bit of roost and we're all living in a kind of wood and in a way that, that it doesn't feel like it's going to last very long. So I think the play... I think the play talks to that, um, that conscious or unconscious feeling that, that big change is coming. Just a, a simple point about you, actually. Is it not exhausting? I mean, it's a very physical play, and you have no understudy. So it's either you or a big hole in the stage, I, I presume. <laughs> so, I mean, that must be really quite tiring and quite daunting. People always say that to me, but... Um, He's a very defiant character, and maybe that's a nice thing about English people, that they, they, they're not to be bossed about easily. Maybe they've been bossed about too much for so many thousands of years, but he's so defiant that if I do think of for a moment in the performance, I'm feeling a bit tired, Rooster kind of, get on with it, you know, I'm not interested in what you're feeling. We've got things to do, I've got things to say. So he, he's... I come out really with a lot of energy, but also you come out with energy. Oh yeah, yeah. Really? I want to do it again. Yeah, <laughs> the, the, but also the, there's a, such a little laughter from the audience. I, 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 I've realised really, I, I just don't care so much for film and television because the live thing is so, well, so vital. You get it there and then. You I'm not meaning your news night thing, by the way. I like <laughs> news night. Not, that's different. <laughs> well, we get instant gratification. I mean, of a making sort. it, you know, making it. Yeah, but um, is, you know, you've been called. You have been called the greatest actor of your generation, and Jez Butterworth, who wrote the play, says, you know, you couldn't really imagine it without you. You might as well burn the script. Those are kind of burdens, aren't they? Well, what's it mean? I'm the greatest liar. <laughs> I, I mean, know. I don't know. Well, I, do, I, don't, I, try to, I don't really... I try not to pay attention to that. They could be a burden, yeah. But, I mean, greatest just means different, really. I don't know. Are you glad to be back? And back on the London stage. Oh, it's back lovely, yeah. We can say some of the naughty words we can't say in Puritan America. Oh, yes, I did hear about that. Well, <laughs> on that happy note, we'll leave it there. Mark Rollins, <laughs> thanks very much. Now, a quick look at tomorrow morning's front pages. The uh, Indy has uh, the speed limit story, new 80-mile-per-hour motor.